Today we're discussing the structure of a scene. Now, the interesting thing about the structure of a scene is that we might think of it more broadly as the structure of a narrative unit. And by that I mean a scene or a sequence or an act or even a global story, because all of these things follow the same structure, interestingly enough. Now it is pretty broad, so uh, let's dive into kind of the five steps of the structure. And basically it goes like this. First, we deliver the exposition or the essential context. Or in, in other words, we tell the audience what they need to know in order to understand the scene or in order to appreciate the scene from an emotional perspective. And then after that, uh, we have the portion of the scene that's escalation. So that's where we, where the character goes after what they want and their obstacles and their disruptions. And then there's a turning point. This is a crisis point where something happens that the character just completely didn't expect. It sometimes make it, makes it seem like they lost their goal or that they've succeeded, but that's a false victory. And so this moment, this turning point, sometimes gives rise to a dilemma. And then from there, that was the third point, and then the fourth point is the climax. And that's where the character uh, responds to that turning point and makes a decision about what to do next. The turning point basically asks the character, you know, this is a completely unexpected thing, what are you gonna do now? And the character says, I'll do this. And that's what the climax is. And then after that is the resolution. And the resolution is the fallout from the character's decision and what they're going to do in the climax. So that's the five-point structure broadly, and we'll go into each one of these in, details, in detail, for a narrative unit. Which means it's this same structure for a scene, a sequence, uh, an actor, or a story. So let's dive into the first bit, exposition. Now, we talked previously about how a story can be driven by a couple of different tools. Or in other words, there has to be something that's keeping the audience's attention. And the most common technique to keep the audience's attention is dramatic tension. A dramatic tension is where a character wants something and is going after that thing and there's a question about whether they'll get it. It's also sometimes known as a dramatic question. Other tools are like dramatic irony, for instance, where a character, uh, where there's a misunderstanding between characters, but um, that's one example of dramatic irony. Dramatic irony is where the audience knows something that one or more other characters don't know. And usually with a misunderstanding, the audience knows that there's a misunderstanding, but the two characters that are misunderstanding each other don't know. Another example of dramatic irony is where there's a secret, and a character is hiding a secret, and we know they have that secret, but they're trying to withhold it from someone else. And that's an example. So these are different tools that create what's called narrative drive. Or in other words, the thing that makes the audience want to know what's going to happen next. And so when we're crafting a scene, we really want to figure out first what's the thing that's going to push forward the scene and keep the audience interested. And if it is dramatic tension, if it is this question of whether the character will get what they want, whether they'll get their goal, then the first thing we need to do in this process is make it clear what the character wants. That's the context of this scene, because if we don't know what the character wants, then we don't know why they're going after, why they're doing what they're doing. Uh, it also makes it harder to understand opposition. There are techniques where we can start a scene without knowing what a character wants, but in most cases we will know. So the first thing is sometimes called the inciting incident, and that's the incident that incites a desire within the character. In other words, it creates the goal that the character will be going after. And it's usually a problem in the character's life or an opportunity. Uh, and it, it comes in different, um, different magnitudes, I guess you could say, depending on whether this is a scene, a sequence, an actor, a story. On the story level, these disruptions, the inciting incident, the thing that creates the central desire that the character will go after over the story, is usually big. Something completely unexpected and something of a large magnitude happens in the character's life. Like the huge problem that's the worst thing they could have expected or an opportunity that's the best thing they could have, uh, could have thought of. So that is the inciting incident. We need to know that. Then we also need to know if there are any rules that the character is going to need to follow over the course of this scene or over this narrative unit. Like if they're on a space station, for instance, and 
gra- artificial gravity has been turned off, we need to know that. We need to know that up front so that we know what the rules are in the methods that the character can use as they pursue their goal. We also need to know if anything in the setting will become important. Are there any items or objects or is there like a swinging vine that we need to foreshadow that the character is ultimately going to use uh, in in their in the climax of the scene that's going to defeat the antagonist? We need to see all that stuff up front. And that's a huge part of the context of the scene. We need to know what is going to be important for the scene uh, before we go through it. So that's the first stage. Uh, the second stage is the escalation. So if a character knows what they want, and I was watching uh, this video on Lessons from the Screenplay, and it was an excerpt from a James Bond movie, and he was chasing this bomb maker through the streets. And so the first part of the scene was setting up this chase. And we knew what it was, because we knew what he wanted and what he was going after. And then uh, we saw him go through the chase. So that's what this escalation bit is. It's where the character pursues the thing that they want. Now it's not normally a... It doesn't normally go as the character planned. Like, for instance, the antagonist or the opponent or the person that the character is chasing or the person the character is trying to escape usually does things that they don't expect. They're smarter than they think. And uh, that throws a a wrench in the character's plan, and they have to improvise, and they have to look around in the story world and come up with new techniques to to go after the opponent or the antagonist. And that's where the importance of the story world or the setting comes in when you're writing a scene. So this is the escalation bit. Something to note here is that sometimes there's moral decay over this narrative unit or over the scene or act or even story where a character will be going after something and they'll become frustrated as they can't get it. They'll become increasingly frustrated and they'll start to morally decay or in other words they'll start to become more desperate and they'll be willing to use techniques and tactics and strategies that are perhaps more immoral than we would like or that the character would think that they would originally use at the start of the narrative unit. So that's an important part of this kind of escalation of the scene. So that brings, oh, oh, something also to note in this escalation period where the scene is going, is getting more and more uh, intense, I guess you could say, is that things that are indirect tend to become direct and things that are subtextual tend to come to the surface. So... Uh, And fighting that's long range tends to become close range. Like things really start to intensify. That's a key part and raise the stakes during this escalation in the scene. So one of my favorite uh, examples of this is in The Office, the dinner party episode, where Michael and Jan are having this subtextual fight all night. And the dinner guests are incredibly uncomfortable because they recognize what's going on but they uh nobody wants to say it out loud right so this whole this sequence is just that yeah courtney i know it's terrible right but it's one of the best episodes in the office i think and i think the reason the thing that makes it one of the best episodes is that you have this intense opposition but it's all subtextual and they are lashing out at each other but saying it all indirectly now the turning point of that sequence of that of the episode I would argue is when Jan and Michael's argument st- when they're sitting down at the dinner table and their argument starts to come to the surface and the indirectness starts to turn to directness and they start openly fighting with each other and then that turning point that uh kind of it's almost like a climax in, in terms of the action is that uh Jan throws the dundee at Michael's TV and it's just the worst thing that could happen, right? But in that moment, that's where anything that's indirect becomes direct. So that's an important part of escalation is that over time in the scene, uh, subtextual activities or speech becomes more direct. And that leads to the turning point. And that's the turning point where something happens that makes us think that the character is getting what they want or failing to get what they want. Uh, something happens that makes us think that it's over or they've, they've done it. And it's, it's a false defeat 
much of the time, or it's a false victory, one of those things. It's also possible that it's actually a defeat or a victory. Uh, in the James Bond example, it's where he's chasing the bomb maker and he chases him into an, the embassy. And he's not allowed to go in there, but he does go. And then he gets him, but he's surrounded by the guards of the embassy. And they've got guns on him. And so in that moment, you feel like, well, I guess this is it. He didn't get him. Uh, and now, you know, he might get killed. So this end of the line for him. Now, he decides to shoot the guy, the bomb maker, and he wanted to take him in alive, but that's his decision. So that brings us to the fourth point, which is the climax. And this is where the character decides what to do in response to that turning point or that uh, crisis moment where something unexpected happens. And so James Bond, in that example, he decides to shoot the bomb maker and uh, I think blow up some canisters as well, you know, as you do when you're James Bond, and that creates this massive disruption, and that's his, his way out of there. So he fails his mission, but he, do, he gets out of it. So, pros and cons. Uh, there is an important point in the time between the turning point and the climax where something unexpected has happened and the character has to decide what to do, and then uh, the, the moment where the character decides what to do, that's this deliberation period. It's also sometimes known as the reaction cycle. So the character goes through their options, essentially, and they look at them first emotionally, like, how do I emotionally feel about this? How does this disruption of this turning point make me feel according to my moral codes and what my beliefs and my opinions? And the next is a, an analytical reaction. Well, what are my options here? What can I do? Uh, have any routes been cut off? Things like that. And then lastly is anticipation. So the character will run counterfactual simulations and anticipate what it would look like if they took any given uh, course of action, basically. So they come up with a plan about what to do next. And then the climax is where they enact that plan. And then last, after the climax, the fifth point of a narrative unit is resolution. It's where we find out that James Bond, uh, the fallout of whatever decision he made at the climaxes. So if he decided to kill the bomb maker, in that instance, he gets his backpack, even though he killed him, and he sees on the cell phones a clue. So that's where the fallout happens, and the fallout, the resolution, will usually push us into the next scene. There's also something in uh, John York's book, Into the Woods, where he talks about this technique that I think it's Lee Child uses, called topspin. And that's where the inciting incident, or the thing that creates the desire in the character, will have been established before the scene starts. And the climax, or the character's decision about what to do after the turning point, is rendered in a different scene. So we get just, we know what the character wants, they're going after what they want, and then disruption, 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 turning point, crazy thing happens, and the next scene. And this is fantastic for thrillers because there's no downtime. It's just, I want this thing, crazy things are happening, unexpected things are happening, bam, it looks like I'm not gonna get what I want or I have gotten what I want, next scene. And that is a, a really powerful way of keeping the audience uh, continually wanting to get to the next scene. And then additionally, it keeps the pace incredibly high, which is important for actions, thrillers, things like that. So that's the general structure of a narrative unit where a narrative unit is any scene, act, sequence, global story, anything like that. Now, uh, there are a lot of, I would say it's, even though it's a great method for analyzing a scene, it may not necessarily be the best method for writing a scene. I think there are other great techniques for that, which uh, we can go over, but that's, that's a different thing. It's, I think it's focused more on disruptions and escalation and seeing a scene as a series of unexpected problems and opportunities. And if you see a scene as a series of unexpected problems and opportunities that give rise consistently to new desires, and you follow the protagonist along those desires, I think it becomes a much more organic process of writing the scene and not needing to necessarily think about these five points uh, explicitly. But it is... It is a valuable thing to look at, especially when you're analyzing a scene. So I hope that helps. So I forget the name, but somebody was asking about whether you can have a five-act structure in TV. And the short answer is yes. 
I will generally say, when people always ask me, like, can you do this? The answer is normally, but not always, but almost always, yes. Because in writing, I think one of the side effects of having a community where writing tips are so prevalent and so easily accessible is that we feel like there are things that we can do and there are things that we can't do and that we have to find out whether we can do a thing first and and or find an applicable writing tip for that and see if see if it'll work uh, and this is not directed at anyone or anything in specific i just i think it's important to change perspective from does this work or in other words is there a rule that allows me to do this versus what would be the effect that this would have? Can I do this and will it give me the effect I want to have in the story? And that's really, I think, a more powerful and, yeah, I guess a, a, a looser way, but also a more organic way of building a story where you can think, is this thing going to get me the effect that I want to have in the story? So let's think about that question, not from do we know of a writing rule that tells us, yes, we can do this or no, we can't do this, but rather let's start to break it down to the kind of first principles of that question. So the question is, can we have five acts in uh, a television episode? So I think the first question we have to ask is, what is an act? Now the problem with this is it depends who you ask. And even then, there's really not a lot of consensus around what an act is. One of my favorite answers is from uh, Adam Skelter, who talks about an act being a change in the, a fundamental change in the character's strategy. And so from a story perspective or a traditional kind of three-act story perspective, he breaks it down into four acts, which I think is more valuable than doing three acts because you take the story and split it at the midpoint. So you can have act one, act two A, act two B, and act three, which results in three acts. But you'll notice something there that although Adam Skelter is correct that you kind of change the character strategy in each one of those acts generally, the other thing is that each of them ends with a turning point. Each of those acts is kind of defined by the fact that it ends with a turning point. And Chuck Wendig, Wendig talked about this, which I thought was, you know, insightful, that every narrative unit, as we've been talking about today, whether it's a scene, a sequence, an act, or the, the story, has a central disruption, a turning point, a moment where something unexpected happens that has consequences. It's usually a problem, an opportunity, it can sometimes also be a revelation. And that is what starts the next narrative unit. So you can almost think of an act as a self-contained bit of narrative that ends in, a, in, in an impactful turning point. And something else we'll notice here is that uh, stories have the largest turning points, acts have the second largest turning points, sequences have the third largest, scenes have the fourth. Which means, in theory, if you're doing this in a structured way, Every sequence should have a, a stronger or larger turning point than a scene. Of course, the scene that ends the sequence is the one that has the sequence's turning point, so that's gonna have a big one. And additionally, every act should have a stronger uh, turning point than the sequence. Also depends how you define sequence and act, right? Because uh, that depends how you, it's all about definitions here. But if you have two sequences in an act, generally, the second sequence should have a larger turning point than the first sequence because the second sequence is the end of the act and acts have larger turning points than sequences. And what I mean to say by that is that acts have a larger disruption that has a more impactful consequence. Something, a problem or an opportunity arises that is more unexpected and needs to be uh, needs to be handled basically like there it forces a reaction by the characters and that's a key point of uh, of a turning point so when we talk about acts I would define an act as anything any contained narrative unit on this on a global story level that has a massive turning point 
Again, that's really ambiguous, but there's a reason why it's ambiguous, and it's because it's not helpful to be any more specific. And this is another thing I like to think about with writing rules is like, well, if you can't be super specific and it doesn't actually help you write, then is it helpful? And that raises another point. Maybe it's not helpful. Maybe we shouldn't think of our story in terms of acts. Although it is helpful to be able to communicate to other writers that yes, I'm at this section in my story. So I'm in act one, I'm in act two, I'm in act three. That tells us generally where we are. But let's think about what purpose does act one, two, and three serve in a general story. Well, in most stories that are based around dramatic tension where a character is going after something when they have a strong goal, that act system is based around the character's goal. And namely that the end of act one is this dramatic question moment, this moment that gives rise to the question of whether the character will get what they want. It gives rise to the character's desire. That's what the end of act one is. It's a problem or opportunity that solidifies what the character wants. That's what it is. Then at the end of act two, there's a crisis moment, which is usually a response to that goal that the character wanted. So the character either usually gets it and it's a hollow victory or they fail to get it and it's an all is lost moment. And so if we think of acts in that way, not necessarily as there need to be three acts, but if we think of it in terms of what the character wants and inciting what the character wants, giving rise to that desire, and then answering what that character wants. So that, I think, is a more beneficial approach to looking at act structures. And while you'll end up in the same place, usually, it can help when you're looking at something like TV, where, honestly, because it's longer form, and books, because it's longer form, you don't have to be as strict with the structure. You don't have to do exactly three acts, and they don't have to happen at exactly the uh, you know, 25% mark and exactly the 75% mark. Different characters can have different inciting incidents and different crises at different times. That is a perfectly fine way to do it. And so when we talk about, when we think about a character uh, or a TV episode having five acts, what we're really saying is that there are five distinct turning points, five moments where something impactful happens that forces a character to respond and gives rise to a new desire or a fundamentally altered desire. Uh, usually that's the case, that it gives rise to a different desire. So that is, so absolutely we can do that in a TV episode, right? You see that all the time. Uh, John Truby, I was listening to one of his classes and he was talking about how you know, he's seen TV episodes with five acts, six acts, he's even seen seven acts, right? Absolutely. Now, so right there, I attempted to just break that down through first principles and look at whether we could break a TV episode down into five acts and whether we could have that. And I would say yes. But if you're not satisfied with that logic there, there is also John York's book called Into the Woods. And he does a 300 page sort of breakdown about why he thinks story is most powerful as five acts. He thinks that we should even view film and screenplays in terms of five acts, which are traditionally thought of in, in terms of three acts. He argues that Shakespeare wrote in five acts and a lot of plays were five acts and that a lot of great stories can be broken down into five acts. The reason why I think this gets so messy and the reason why it may not necessarily even be helpful to think in terms of acts is that even writing teachers, even those who are professors at you know UCLA, USC, you ask them what the inciting incident of a movie is, and they're liable to give you different answers. Because the truth is, it's when something happens. That's kind of the definition, like something happens. And sometimes it's a problem, and sometimes it's an opportunity, and the degree to which that thing happening is impactful to the story is uh, subjective in some ways. Like I might think that one thing is way more important to the character's journey than another thing that happened. 
But they're both important because they alter the story. They turn the story. That's what they do. They, they're turning points. They're disruptions. So in the book that I'm writing on storytelling, uh, and I'll do a short plug here, go to kingo.com, K-I-I-N-G-O.com, and sign up for the newsletter so you can get uh, reminded when it comes out, or I'll keep you updated, rather. Uh, in that book, I talk about how it's far more helpful from a writing perspective to view stories in terms of a chain of disruptions and a chain of unexpected things that happen that cause a character to look in a new direction with a new desire, come up with a new plan, and head in that direction. It is much more realistic in the sense that it's, uh, it's understandable. That's how life works. It's also how drama works because it creates a chain of cause and effect. I want something, I go after it, something unexpected happens that sends me in a new direction, I now head off in that new direction. It's natural, it's organic. And we can write that way and we don't have to think about acts. Don't have to think about them at all. Again, acts are valuable in the sense that we can communicate with other writers. There's really not much in the writing community or the writing nomenclature that we have in common. There's not a lot of terms that everyone agrees agrees upon, not a lot of definitions that are shared, so it does help to have the React structure as a commonality that we can all agree on and discuss together. But it may not be the most helpful for our writing. So, long, long, long answer short, yes, absolutely, you can write a TV episode with five acts. Go for however much feels natural. All right, thank you everybody who joined. Appreciate you being here. Uh, if you have a question about your story or storytelling or writing, please leave it below. Or, you know, how you doing? How you feeling? I suppose we don't have to talk about story either. But uh, I'll stick on for a little bit and we can discuss anything. I can also go into anything in more detail. If you were here for the first bit where we talked about narrative structure and s scenes and acts and sequences and global stories, there's this... Reaction cycles, I think, are incredibly important for what the character, how the character is going to respond to a disruption. So we, I talked a while about plotting a character based on unexpected things happening, but then for every unexpected thing that happens, the character is going to have an emotional response to that thing, depending on the magnitude of that disruption. This, this may be a little bit sacrilegious here, but I haven't seen the new Star Wars yet. But I have heard, and I should see this, I guess, before I start commenting, I've heard that one of the problems is in the pacing, and that there was so much going on, so much action, and so little time for the characters to actually take a breath and emotionally take in what happened to them. And that's not just important for the characters, it's important for the audience, because characters are the proxy for the audience. When a character feels fear, that's how we feel fear. When a character feels joy, that's how we feel joy. So if you want the audience to take a second, breathe, take in the emotional impact of a situation, you gotta have a character do that. I mean, that's a, a kind of basic principle is that generally if you want the audience to feel something, have a character feel that thing. Now it does depend whether we like the character or not, right? If a bad thing happens to a bad person, we might feel joy. If a good thing happens to a bad person, we might feel sadness. Uh, hopelessness, something like that. But it is important to consider how we can mirror emotions from characters to the audience. All right, well, I'll leave, I'll stick around for a couple more minutes and if nobody has any more questions, we'll end it for the night and we'll get back to writing. But if you do have any question, please feel free to leave it below. I'd be happy to discuss. I see buttons over here. Oh yeah, so we have some questions or we have some answers. If you haven't yet responded to the story, so we're outlining a story together. I'm, I'm doing this kind of experiment, I guess you could say, where we all outline a story together by coming up with different answers uh, to different points in the outline and kind of brainstorm together and then vote on the best things. And so one of the last things we did, or the first thing we did, is define the occupation of the protagonist, and there's some great occupations that were suggested. There's giraffe therapist, silversmith, 
um, a crayon namer, which I liked, a quicksand sampler, which I thought was fantastic, and the one that won, which is the vlogger in a post-apocalyptic world. So if you haven't yet, check out the story and uh, give us some ideas, some of your ideas about why that protagonist would be vlogging in a post-apocalyptic world. What are they doing? Like It seems out of place, seems like they'd have bigger things to worry about. Why are they doing that? Uh, I'm really curious to see what you all come up with. All right, so Vermilion Star has a question. Thoughts on creating fictional languages? So first of all, I love world building. It's fantastic, and this is a great question. I'll also say that uh, I'm not as big into creating fictional languages as some are, and that's not because I don't like it, it's just because I don't have a lot of experience in it. I know that it's generally called conlang, C-O-N-L-A-N-G, which is kind of a, I think it's constructive, or, or construct constructing a language kind of thing. I'm sure it stands for something slightly different. But if you ever go on Reddit or something, there's a, the subreddit conlang, where they're just going to have so much information on creating fictional languages. There are some fantastic uh, subreddits for world building if you're into that. There's just the world building subreddit is fantastic. So my thoughts on it, I think it's super cool. And I think it can be a valuable way to sprinkle a bit of life into a story world and authenticity where if you have characters using phrases or words or vocabulary from that fictional language it can make the world feel more lived in and that can really be powerful for making the story world come to life so i'm all for it i mean there is that kind of pull between how much work we should do on world building versus how much work we should do on storytelling and I personally love world building so much that it can pull me in and make me want to just work on world building and not actually get to the storytelling part. And so that can be a challenge, you know, if you'll know that about yourself. So obviously, you know, adjust yourself accordingly. But if you're the type of person who loves world building so much that you can get lost in building a fictional language for weeks and months and such, uh, just know, first of all, whether that's something you want to do. And if it is, if you're satisfied with just that, go for it. That's awesome and a great way to express yourself. But if you do want to eventually get to writing the story and incorporating that, maybe set a time limit on yourself or use some other technique, some other, I guess, anti-procrastination technique. I know it's not really procrastinating, but it is kind of going down that research hole, that rabbit hole that is we can get stuck in, especially when it comes to world building. It's a great question for me, and I, I wish I could give you more answers. Um, yeah, Courtney says, I think there's some info out there on how Tolkien created Elvish. Yeah, absolutely. Like I said, that Conlang subreddit too has some great stuff. And you're absolutely right, Courtney. There is fantastic information about there for creating fictional languages. I know there's even some software where you can put in the different grammar rules, I believe it is, and you can put in the different letters. Courtney says, what's the theme of today's discussion? Yes, so earlier we were talking about creating or writing narrative units, which is a kind of nerdy way of saying how do we write a scene and that there are five different points in a scene, really. And, and I say narrative unit because it doesn't just apply to a scene. It also applies to a sequence, an act, and even a global story. And these five points are the essential context or the, uh, the context or the exposition, which usually is the inciting incident where we define what the character wants. And then the second stage is escalation where the character starts going after what they want, they run into roadblocks and obstacles and disruptions. Then the third bit is a turning point. Something happens completely unexpected that makes us think that they won or lost. And then there's this deliberation and reaction cycle. Then the, the fourth bit is the climax where the character makes a decision about what to do in response to the turning point, takes an action. And then the fifth bit is the resolution, which is the fallout from the character's climax or what they decide to do in response to the turning point. Now, this is the structure of a narrative unit. It's pretty broad. I don't think it's the most helpful tool for writing. I do think it's a fantastic tool for analyzing. And that's one of the challenges. I try not to go too much off into these rants, but that is one of the challenges with writing 
advice or writing books, things like that, is a lot of the tools are crafted for analysis. They're crafted to look at existing stories and say, how do these existing stories work? But they're not crafted necessarily to be helpful in writing, to actually take pen to paper and put something there. So I try to think about what tools would be helpful as far as that's concerned. Uh, Mimundo says, sometimes I feel stuck in the moment. I feel I have to make more research about a subject and I don't continue with the story. Yeah, that totally makes sense. And I have that problem too. Um, so, it first of all, the amount of research you do is going, or you're going to need to do, is dependent on the genre of the story, obviously. If you're doing a period piece, or you're doing a historical drama or something like that, you're just going to have to do more research. You're just going to have to. And that's a challenge. But if you're doing a different genre like action, or mystery or thriller maybe, or even just drama, I, you may not have to do as much research. I mean, it really comes down to a lot of it, the story world. And this is one of the valuable bits of doing fantasy or sci-fi, right? Is that you can completely make up the rules as long as generally they're consistent. Some readers are more forgiving than others. But that's the value of it is you don't have to do a lot of the same research. Okay, so you're doing science fiction. Well, that does give you a bit of leeway in terms of what you can do, and science fiction is a bit tricky because readers do like to see things that are technologically, or scientifically plausible, that you want, <laughs> yeah, you want the reader to think, can that happen? You don't want them to think like, oh no, that could never happen. Uh, one of the techniques if you've got a if you've got a technology that is kind of stretching the imagination and doesn't seem possible, is to bring in an expert in the field and have them say, this is not possible. And then the other one says, I know it's not, but it's happening. And then the reader's like, oh, okay, I guess, I guess it is possible. Uh, that's a good technique. I, you know, the fact that you recognize the problem, or not problem, but challenge of spending a lot of time researching is is good on its own so the fact that you recognize it will help you because you'll be able to stop yourself from going down those rabbit holes there are things that you can do like if you're trying to be scientifically accurate on a wound that a character has or something like that you're trying to get the details of that it's kind it's possible that you just kind of put in a bracket like research this later and continue the flow and I think Vermillion's mentioned this too, having research days where you only research, uh, separating them from the writing days. Yeah, that's a great suggestion. And I think if you, on the writing days where you're focusing on drama and character interaction and theme and things that don't have to do with the specificity of the story world necessarily, on those days, put a bracket and like a, a come back to this later or a to do, some sort of flag or marker that will tell you uh, I need to finish this on a research day, but this is what will end up happening, essentially, and then continue on with the story. I think that's probably a good a good method. You, have, you know, try that out. Let me know if it works. If anybody else has any suggestions, please, please feel free to throw them out. Vermilion, your suggestion of having research days, really like that. I think that's, uh, that's a, great, a great suggestion there. And Vermilion says, how would you go about... Oh, so first, first of all, uh, Namunda, hopefully that helps. Let me know if it does or it doesn't. Maybe we can try to dive into a different aspect of that question. Uh, Vermillion says, how would you go about writing a series? Interested to hear your thoughts on the subject. Yes. So I was listening to the Story Grid podcast the other day, and series are interesting because they're like everything. There are no specific rules about what must happen in a series. Now we can look at the most successful series series, uh, and look at what they have in common perhaps, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have that. So I will say that generally it will be about growth or decay, the series. And it's not necessarily the growth or decay of a character, although it usually or sometimes is, but the growth and decay of a society. 
and the change from chaos to order or from order to chaos. So if we look at Star Wars, for instance, that the first trilogy is about going from chaos to order, or maybe uh, we can think of it as authoritarianism to freedom, where the empire is on top and the re rebellion is below. And at the end, the Return of the Jedi, you flip it. And if you think about the, the prequels, it's going from freedom to authoritarianism, or from order to chaos. And that goes from the, not rebellion, but the republic being on top, to, the, to flipping that so the empire's on top, in terms of power structure. And so thinking about, and if we think about Harry Potter too, it's kind of from order to chaos, in the sense that over time, Voldemort and his power structure is taking control and command. And the journey is about trying to resist that move from freedom to authoritarianism. Now your story doesn't have to have that specific theme, but there generally is some sort of move from chaos to order, from order to chaos. And exploring that is a pretty powerful thing you can do. I think that was one of the one of the problems with the, the sequel trilogy for Star Wars is that it didn't have a clear arc in terms of the societies of the story world. Uh, it also, the arcs of the characters weren't super clear either. You know, if you think about the prequel and the first trilogy, they tell the story of one character, really, and it's Darth Vader, it's Anakin Skywalker, and it's the decay of Anakin Skywalker and then the redemption of Anakin Skywalker. And that's a really interesting story to me. And at the same time as you have that character arc going on, you also have a story world and societies changing and moving from chaos to order, order to chaos. And so that's a, an interesting thing that you can do as well. So for series, I think it's powerful to look at what is the dynamic of the communities in the story world. Are communities coming together? Are they splitting apart? Is one dominating another? Is one escaping authoritarianism? Uh, what's going on with the communities of the story world? And that will provide a spine about, uh, they'll provide a spine to the series. And then through that, explore how a character's journey is altered or how it alters the community's arc or the, the dynamics of the community and their growth of, or their journey of growth and decay. So, yeah, it's, it's a pretty broad thing because there are no specific things you need to do in a series. It's, um, you need to create something that's satisfying and has a great theme. And those are principles that hold up even for just a singular story. But it can help to have that overarching cohesive feel to it by having communities go through an arc. So short answer is try to think about what the societal arc will be throughout the series, not just the character arc. I've really says, awesome how you mentioned that you can be about growth and decay, but they can be about growth and decay. This is what I'm creating in my series, though it's mostly character driven. There is a background plot about the nation's decay. Cool, awesome. So it sounds like you have it covered, honestly. And if you can bring that out and have that perhaps nation's decay start to climax more toward, if you're doing a trilogy, for instance, the third book or toward the end of the series, that could be thematically powerful. That's a great question. Okay, let's see. So Courtney says, so we were talking about narrative units and defining those five points and she says, that completely makes sense. Sometimes I don't know enough about a subject to create the effect I want. Oh, research and development is so important. Yeah, that's, so she was commenting on the question um, for research as well and how not to get kind of bogged down in that. And you're absolutely right. I, I have that trouble too. It's so fun to do research too. That's the challenge with it. All right, I'm gonna wrap up tonight Thank you all so much for being here. It has been fantastic. Thank you for your great questions. And uh, I'll talk to you all a little bit later. Happy writing and have a great week.
Owen Vermillion says, I left an answer in your story. Excited to see what kind of answers other people suggest for sure. I'll be sharing that tomorrow after people submit everything. Okay, have a good night, everybody.